Okay, uh, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on this uh, Friday evening. Um, my name is Jahan Chu, and I am the uh, founder of the Ethereum Hong Kong Meetup. Uh, I'm also one of the founding members of the Bitcoin Association uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and we actually have one of our uh, kind of organization leaders over here, Dominique, in the front row. Raise your hand. Thank you very much. Uh, just in case you will have any questions about the Bitcoin Association and what types of uh, programs and outreach we do, you may ask uh, Dominique. Uh, and also, more recently, I've shifted over full-time into blockchain, uh, and I'm a, a partner in Gen Advisors, and we are doing uh, advisory uh, and investment in the blockchain space, and obviously, I'm a huge fan of Ethereum, and that's why we're all here tonight. Um, first, I want to say uh, a very big thank you to Simon Phipps and KPMG for your lovely space, uh, for your uh, very generous hosting of all the drinks and all the snacks and stuff, uh, and again, uh, once again, just for welcoming us into, into your space. Uh, we're very, very happy to be able to fill it um, to, the, to the brim, so thank you very much. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have um, Vitalik Buterin once again. Uh, he's the co-founder of Ethereum. Uh, he is the winner of the World Technology Award of 2015. He is a Peter Thiel Fellow, uh, and more recently, he had a, um, an inclusion on the Fortune magazine's 40 Under 40, which I thought was quite cool. Uh, there's a really great piece on him uh, in Fortune magazine that which just came out, so I hope you can uh, go and read that. Um, and, you know, he probably won't enjoy me saying this, but in my mind, I think he's really one of the brightest minds kind of articulating uh, the blockchain and distributed and uh, decentralized space, um, articulating not only the, the kind of technological framework that I think will drive a lot of industries in the future, everything from insurance to supply chain to obviously financial, but I think even more, uh, more important, what we're really seeing uh, from Vitalik, as well as from others, uh, is leadership in the space of uh, ethics uh, and of how to kind of respond to an increasingly volatile and dangerous uh, technological uh, environment where hacks are happening on a daily basis uh, and being able to set a precedent for how to respond to these and how to communicate with the community, I think is, is something which uh, we don't quite uh, appreciate how important it is to set these precedents, but increasingly will become more and more valuable uh, for us as a society. So I really appreciate that part of it. Um, I, think, I think that uh, most of us, um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, uh, and I don't really need to say too much about blockchain in general, but for those of you who are kind of new to Bitcoin, new to blockchain, new to Ethereum, um, I'll just say, you know, ask a quick question of myself, you know, what is blockchain, what is Ethereum, and why do we need it? Um, and usually when people ask me, especially, you know, my, my wife's friends or my parents, you know, they still ask me, I, you know, I still don't really understand this whole uh, blockchain thing and, you know, what, is exact, what exactly is it? Uh, and the way that I really like to try and explain it in a very simple way is that blockchain represents a layer, an additional layer on top of the internet, uh, which solves a few of its uh, kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, one of those vulnerabilities I think uh, it addresses, not solves completely, is security. Uh, and we just had a demo before uh, with Reuven Heck of Uport looking at the Uport uh, identity solution. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of things uh, that are being developed in the space um, that will really contribute to make, giving us a, a safer internet, a more effective internet, a cheaper internet, and a more functional internet. Uh, and I think that at its very base layer, that's really what blockchain offers to us. There's a lot of technology, there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of mathematics and cryptography which goes on behind the scenes, but at its base, at its very foundation, blockchain is helping us have a better internet experience. Um, as far as what are people really doing with blockchain, there's a lot. I mean, we actually, the reason why we're doing this meetup today uh, is just really just to kind of celebrate uh, what happened last week. Many of us in this room were up in Shanghai for a whole week from Monday to Saturday at the DevCon, uh, DevCon 2, which is the annual Ethereum Developers Conference. Uh, we were up there for both DevCon 2 as well as for the Wanxiang uh, Blockchain Summit. Uh, and at that, for that whole week, we were really blessed to have uh, really an array of amazing presentations from blockchain startups, uh, from professional organizations, from Fortune 500 companies, everybody from uh, Microsoft to BHP to some of the largest Chinese internet companies, all 
putting their projects forth and showing how they're taking on blockchain, taking on Ethereum specifically, uh, and developing in this space. So in the last, I would say, six months, we've really seen a shift from what's possible and what's conceptual to what's actionable and what's being executed. And I think, you know, for myself, that was one of the biggest takeaways. Uh, I saw a lot of really cool things up there. Um, I saw an application which is live, which uh, is taking insurance uh, for flight delays. If you, you can insure your flight before you actually leave uh, via the blockchain. Uh, we saw some presentations about uh, Internet of Things, being able to in enable devices securely over the blockchain. Uh, and I saw on the side a, a crypto asset management portfolio protocol on the side. I also saw a drone air traffic control application, all trying to take advantage of the security, interoperability, uh, and you know, lesser friction that the blockchain offers. So there's really a, a lot of amazing things. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Vitalik to kind of give his overview and his kind of highlights of what he felt uh, were the most important things. But I guess, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jahan, for organizing this. And uh, thanks to uh, everyone here for coming. So DEFCON, DEFCON 2, I guess, to start off explaining what it is, is a, uh, well, DEFCON is Ethereum's annual uh, developer conference. So a uh, kind of event where we uh, comprehensively talk about issues around Ethereum protocol research, well, uh, Ethereum client development, Ethereum contract programming, it's developing Ethereum applications. Um, so this time around, DEF CON 2 was actually the third DEF CON. So as uh, the computer scientist, someone you might know, computer scientists like starting uh, counting things starting from zero. So DEF CON 0 was actually the sort of tiny events that we had in uh, Berlin back in uh, 2014. This was before the protocol even launched. And it was basically just like an internal sort of me meeting of all of our developers. It was held inside of the uh, ETH Dev uh, BV office in Berlin. And uh, we uh, just brought over the entire team together along with like a couple of people from uh, Consensus and, and, a, and a few others and just sort of talked about everything that we were doing. At the time, there was a lot of exciting stuff, but Ethereum was not even released yet until it was pretty early stage. Last year, we had DEF CON 1 over in London. Um, let's see if I can uh, actually whoop some pictures out of that. Um, so, and, ooh, this is interesting. I can't because the internet's not working. So b basically, in the last year, we went up from uh, having 50 people at our conference to having 300 people there. And we had this uh, event at this, uh, rather, at this rather glorious and overpriced Gibson Hall right in the middle of London City. Um, and uh, we had, uh, it was sponsored by Microsoft. We had 50 of our people, 50 more people from Consensus, lots of people sh uh, showing off their Ethereum applications. So basically just generally talking about it, the Ethereum ecosystem. At the time, Ethereum had actually already existed, but even still, you know, uh, there was very obviously a large amount of interest there, but even still, like, not nearly as much as there is now. So fast forward to this year. Last year, we had a conference in London, pretty much, you know, the heart of Europe, fairly, uh, a fairly frequent and uh, not particularly difficult flight away from North America and we had 300 people. This year, we're, we held the DEF CON 2 in Shanghai, 10,000 kilometers and a visa away from almost all everyone who wanted to attend. And even still, we got up from 300 attendees to 700. So communities been, the community has been growing fairly quickly. Um, so we had three days, uh, the DEF CON 2 was split into uh, three days. So like, there was the entire blockchain week, which was six days, but out of that week, the, the latter three, like the fourth day was a demo day where there were about 36 uh, projects that were showing off Ethereum um, blockchain applications. And uh, actually it was 31 projects showing off blockchain applications. And actually I counted and at least 16 of them ran, uh, were based on Ethereum. Um, so then 
um the last two days were kind of a blo- the one uh, one blockchain summits that it was more kind of industry and and uh, applications focused, and there were a lot of uh, interesting things that were that were presented there too. So DefCon itself, first day focusing on research, second day focusing on development, and or like at least core development, and third day focusing on DApps and uh, DApp development. So let's see if this works now. So from a uh, research standpoint, I think like the um, Ethereum projects generally has kind of four major directions that we're push- that uh, we're trying to push forward on. So the uh, first and actually I uh, have this slide that unfortunately can't access right now. The slide is entitled "Why Does Ethereum Suck?" and I um, outline a few important reasons why Ethereum sucks. Number one, block time is fourteen seconds. So if you send a transaction, you know, people have to wait about 15 seconds for the thing to confirm. If the thing just like runs on Joe's server, then you can push that down to about 500 milliseconds. So, you know, we have something to improve here. The second thing is uh, scalability. So even if you're okay with waiting 14 seconds, the Ethereum uh, blockchain can still only handle about 15 transactions a second. So if you are a major multinational insurance company, and you're trying to create a major multinational insurance application that will touch millions of customers, then you might want just a bit more than 15 transactions a second, you know? So, third reason why Ethereum sucks is uh, privacy. So basically, blockchains are completely public. Every single transaction is public. Now, as those of you who have at least kind of studied internet protocols, cryptography, or computer science might know, there actually are ways to there are a lots of protocols where all the information that passes the, that gets sent is complete it can theoretically be seen by everyone but because the data is encrypted in various ways like the information that actually matters like the actual content of the messages is still obscured to everyone but the sender and the recipient now with uh, blockchains theoretically you can do that too but in some cases, it's harder than just with the, to do with uh, a lot of blockchain protocols than it is with information exchange. And so far, the kind of protocols and the tools to do that don't really exist in sort of that nice a form. So then a kind of fourth point is a security, which is basically that the, the protocol itself is, um, you know, it, is, is relatively fine. Like even with the attacks that happens during DEF CON, like even, even there, the network kept on going the whole time, actually. So, you know, first of all, so the attacks that happened actually, they weren't even attacks on consensus, right? They were denial of service attacks. They were basically attacks that made one of the clients kind of crash when it, when it processed some transactions because of the way it implemented it. It tried to kind of, the transaction forced it to consume kind of much more memory than it should have. And uh, that ended up for preventing uh, those clients from processing the transaction. But fortunately, because there exists these sort of multiple implementations of Ethereum, you know, these completely independently written code bases that all implement the same protocol, half the network went down, the other, the other half of the network kept on going strong. So at the same time, you know, the incident still made us uh, kind of look hard at how that particular client is implemented, made, made us look hard at kind of security procedures, emergency response procedures. Like even before the incident, there was already a security audit scheduled for the, for that particular client. So like for the protocol itself, things are continuing to move forward and will continue to move forward. But that's actually the piece that I'm a bit less concerned about. The piece that I'm concerned more about is actually two parts. One of them is the security of applications built on the protocol. So applications basically meaning, you know, if I write a smart contract, how, you know, the smart contract might say that it's an escrow contract and the, might, and the contract might have functions that make it look like an escrow contract. But what if somewhere on line 153, there's a piece of code that says, oh, by the way, George can take the money, money at any time. So there's two sub problems there. One of them is, well, what if a developer has some bug accidentally? And the second one is, what if a developer inserts a bug maliciously? Now, in both of those cases, you know, if users are going to be able going to be able to trust the contracts that they interact with, they have to be able to actually catch those kinds of those kinds of bugs and those kinds of attacks. So there's a there's a bunch of what like kind of math and there's areas like formal verification that try to catch those kinds of bugs automatically. And you know this is one sort of major strand that we're working on. 
Another kind of security is user interface security, or, and, or even specifically user account management security. So in general, you know, if I have, it, the way that you interact with these systems is with a private key, and if you have a private key, that, uh, you know, then you know, every single transaction you sign has to, be in, has to be signed, or every single transaction you send has to be signed with a private key, but what if you lose the private key? Then you lose, the, you lose access to your account. What if some hacker breaks into your computer and steals your private key? You're the hacker can now pretend to be you, steal your identity, and steal your money. So basically, you know, latency, scalability, privacy, security, like these are some of the major reasons why Ethereum sucks. Now, what is research about? Well, it's about taking all four of those directions and improving all of them. So, you know, blockchains right now don't scale. Can we come up with blockchains that do scale? The answer is, in my opinion, yes. Blockchains right now are, are more slow or getting faster. Can we make them even faster? In my opinion, the answer is yes. Blockchains right now have very little privacy. Can we develop protocols that, mean, that still ensure the blockchain's guarantees of process correctness, with, but at the same time not uh, reveal any information that users don't want to reveal? In my opinion, the answer is yes. So research from kind of an Ethereum uh, uh, foundation perspective is basically about looking at the slide, why Ethereum sucks, and seeing how much we can cross out. So that's, uh, that's, so that was, this was the first day. And there were um, a lot of like, fairly uh, interesting things that were presented. So one of them is that as far as blockchain scalability goes, I've been working on proof of stake, which is a uh, consensus algorithm that tries to replace like, proof of work in mining. And uh, I have a document that's called the MOVE paper. And that sort of that describes how that protocol works, and how also on top of proof of stake, there is this concept of sharding, where you basically have sort of a collection of kind of fairly tightly interconnected blockchains that sort of proceed together in parallel, where you only have where you kind of only have a few computers at a time verify each one, and how you can use this kind of approach to massively increase how much uh, this, the scalability of a blockchain. So this is this was part of it. Another part was on, obviously, privacy, on uh, formal verification, so like on automatically verifying the contracts, do what they say they do, and that ha have properties that, that, you, that they should have. And on, look, basically, modifications to the Ethereum protocol and things that you can do on top of it. You know, for day two, for the first, for, for the first two hours, we actually had a pretty heavy security focus. So this was about secure contract programming, formal verification, and particularly about how kind of organizing um, a developer tool and like building developer tools that make it easy for developers to use these tools in order to make their contracts safe. And eventually for users to be able to actually, um, to, tools for users to be able to verify that contracts written by other people that they are asked to, to participate in are safe. So, then after this, uh, there are a lot of presentations on kind of Ethereum kind of protocol development, Ethereum clients. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, one of the exciting developments in sort of Ethereum client design is light clients. So basically being able to securely access the blockchain, but only download very small parts of it. And this is a technology that's like absolutely key for getting Ethereum properly adopted in smartphones, IoT devices, basically anything tinier than a laptop. And even on laptops, honestly, like over here, I, like I'm running the get the uh, the like our sort of alpha light -like client right now because my hard drive just doesn't have enough space for the full one. So the um, then on the third day we focused uh, primarily on applications. So there's um, actually quite a lot of uh, things happening. I might actually be able to show that particular slide. Let's see if I can get into that. And also actually show some of the intro uh, also actually show some of the projects that presented at DEF CON too. Mm. Mm. Right. So this was the uh, presentation. Move Revolution. Um, this was the uh, Dilbert comic that the Move paper is named after. <laughs> In case people wants to read it and laugh, if you don't laugh, Jahan is going to charge an exit fee of uh, of twenty five Hong Kong dollars. 
I denominate in ether. <laughs> um, so there we go. So, so as far as kind of projects that that uh, were at DEF CON go, um, as far as formal verification goes, there's a few interesting ones. So there is uh, one called um, Oyente. Uh, There we go. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a uh, from uh, some researchers in Singapore, and they have come up with a, so basically automatic checking tools that ver that check whether or not contracts contain certain kinds of bugs. And like this is actually something you can just like run on existing contracts automatically, and you can find certain kinds of issues. Like the checker is not perfect. You know, if it tells you everything's okay, it doesn't mean that everything's okay but it can still find something. Can I ask a question really quick? Yeah. So I, I think that uh, one of the things that really emerged uh, out of the conference, and, and I think part of the, the whole program of the conference uh, was you know, organized around security intentionally, right? Because we've yeah. seen a lot of things happening in the community, uh, not just Ethereum, but you know, outside of uh, Ethereum as well, uh, which revolve around uh, coins being stolen. Of course, there was the DAO hack. Um, there have been a number of kind of quite prominent uh, exchanges which have also been hacked. Um, and I think from the general public standpoint, you know, the real question is if this, you know, if the, if the blockchain is supposed to provide a certain level of kind of security, why do these things keep getting hacked? What exactly is the problem here? Uh, and, you know, I guess in terms of how you were programming the actual conference itself, what types of things do you think came out of it um, that really address uh, the general public's question, but then also uh, some of the more existential questions for blockchain technology? I think uh, one important thing you need to understand about security is that security is never going to be 100% solved. Look, security, I think, is necessarily pretty much always going to be just a combination of heuristics, including best practices, tools, um, auditing, and uh, having lots of different people audit it, um, using, diff using different tools, and trying to sort of inch as, as close as we can to kind of the ideal, but I don't think we'll ever sort of fully get there. And one of the reasons why is that basically like the notion of intent is fundamentally complex. So what I mean is that, uh, I mean, I, I already gave this story, I think, at a previous Hong Kong me uh, meetup, uh, even like I exactly here, where I was pointing out that like if you cre create like a super intelligent AI, and if you tell the super intelligent AI cure cancer, then the first thing it's going to do is, okay, it's going to come up with like the best possible, you know, things like chemo chemotherapy, radiotherapy, like gene editing, whatever. And it's going to basically, like, cure, like it'll cure like 99.99% of cancers. But then it'll realize, oh, wait, there's still this 0.01% left. And how am I going to get the last 0.01%? Ooh, I got a bright idea. Let's uh, launch a nuclear holocaust and kill everyone. Yay, no one has cancer anymore. So you might think, well, okay, well, I clearly programmed this thing incorrectly. Well, let's cure cancer without killing everyone. Well, okay, I'm just gonna put everyone into a freezer. Not killing them, I'm just gonna like knock them unconscious and just like conveniently never wake them up. Not the same thing. So the point is that like expressing exactly what you want is, is hard. And in cases where like it, the stakes are very high, like these, uh, like this sort of divide between expressed intent and what your actual intent is, can like the 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 distinction, like even though it might sometimes seem small, can get like very big and very obvious. And this isn't just about you know AI science fiction movies. Like it's I think even in the the uh, sort of uh, scenarios like um, contract program, and we've actually seen this happen. You know, if you look at a concept like fairness, for example. Like we kind of understand intuitively what being fair means, but at the same time, let's try to apply fairness to a decentralized market. Well, you have to, let's see, what kind of, what might it mean for something to be unfair? Well, one, one example of an unfair exchange might be if I make an order, and then let's say if I try and buy some uh, like GAF coin for Ether, then maybe some, like someone will have some way to like steal my, uh, uh, my Ether without giving me any GAF coin. Well, okay, well, maybe an exchange is fair if it has a sort of atomic property where either, you know, you get your Ether and your, ga and your GAF coin, or you get, or either you lose your Ether, but you get your GAF coin, or nothing happens. Well, guess what? There's another kind of attack. 
what if, let's say, there's an exchange where if I put an order, let's say, where I say I want to buy, um, let's say, GAF coin for 10 Ether, and let's say if there's someone who's willing to sell for 11, let's say this exchange has some property that one particular person named, let's say, Jahan Chu, has this, weird, has this magic ability where he can see the orders before everyone else. And so he can basically buy the GAF coin off of the guy uh, off of me at 10 and, and immediately turn around and, and sell it to the other person at 11. And no one else has this ability. Now, now we have an exchange that satisfies the first property. It doesn't steal money from everyone, but it still gives one guy an unfair advantage. So okay, we have to add another, another condition. And then you know, we might discover some other way to cheat the system. Maybe miners can front run it. And then we have to add another condition. So defining complex, even defining complex concepts is not necessarily about understand like, um, but it's it's not always something that can be fully defined. Sometimes it's just a matter of like coming up with sets of conditions that kind of describe things that the thing can't do, and hoping that your list is complete enough. So it does like it does sort of make the problem simpler because instead of checking a big huge pile of code, you're checking a set of conditions. But even still, a problem remains. So this is so that so that's one side. Another side is that even like looking at things like game theoretic incentive of compatibility. Like that's a problem that's fundamentally very hard and, and like very often you even just can't mathematically prove it. So like there are limits to how far kind of securing things can go, no matter what technology you use. And in some cases it's application specific. So you know, right now we just went through an example where we talked about decentralized markets and what it means for a decentralized market to be fair. But what if we make a DAO? What does it mean for a DAO to be fair? Well, maybe the answer is different depending on what the DAO does. What does it mean for like an auction system to be fair? The answer is like completely different there. What does it mean for you know some kind of like a derivatives contract to be fair? Well, or for it to be secure? Well, there might be some other concern. So, like there's ish, the the fact is you know computers have a very hard time determining what the difference is between in um, like with an in intentionally withdrawing money from a contract and exploiting a bug and, and unintentionally exploiting money from a contract. And this is so you can't really break, you, like, this is a gap that you can't fully bridge. But at the same time, there are lots of ways that we can improve it. So like I think like the best way fundamentally to think about security, I think, is actually to think about the gap between intent and what's, and you know, what's, what's, uh, in the solidity code, and seeing if we can find find ways to kind of bring that closer and closer and bridge it. So, part of the solution to that problem is best practices. So basically, just like knowing here are a bunch of bad patterns, and if you use these bad patterns, you are very likely to accidentally do something very dangerous. So don't do this. And you know, if you look at the DAO, if you look at reentrancy bugs, then we've uh, you know the there are a few patterns that have emerged by which you can kind of avoid reentrancy issues, or, and, you know, this is good. So if you write your if you write your code in a way that doesn't deal with these issues, that doesn't have these bad patterns, then you then you don't have reentrancy attacks. There are also like, and the nice thing about a lot of these practices is that you can actually check for them automatically. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that you can do is you can actually have your code specify in different ways what it does and what it's supposed to do. So for example, if you have a contract that's like an exchange, you can actually specify, you know, this contract is meant to, like if you stick coin A into the contract, either you can get coin A out or you lose coin A, but you can get a, a specified amount of coin B back. So, you know, that's sort of like one particular atomic fairness property. And you can have automatic tools, formal verification, to automatically check and prove that a particular contract satisfies that problem. Once again, not a, not a panacea. There might be something that you forgot to check for. And, but at the same time, it can help improve things. So there's, uh, I mean, third thing that you can do, you know, you can check if who the code has been audited by or, you know, who the, who the code has been written by. Number four, ideally even check, like, it, if you can avoid it, don't write code at all. Use existing pieces of code that are standardized. So I think like we a lot of these different things were covered. Like at DEF CON, you know, we talked about best practices. There are at least like three presentations on different types of formal verification. And I think in like a lot some of those presentations, yeah, some of them actually presented at DEF CON one. 
but you know there was huge progress that was made like in, in the intervening year like back when Emanjo presented during their first year they were just like barely doing an alpha and now they have like a product that's pretty much almost ready so it's it really is moving forward but at the same time we do need to realize that it kind of is incremental I, I think that's quite, quite interesting so well, what I'm taking away from some of that is that we kind of need to be a bit more patient uh, in how we look at this system and and although you know blockchain is quite revolutionary and it offers so many uh, amazing magical things for society and for money and for you know industry at the same time it's still not fully baked uh, and it will take some time but then I guess the you know just to kind of flip that question around then um, what what can we expect um, from what blockchain can deliver you know in the short term because there's so much uh, kind of buzz there's so much talk I mean every day there's new articles uh, I remember the old days when we used to kind of you know uh, have a little celebration and you know when blockchain or Bitcoin at the time, they didn't even say blockchain, when Bitcoin and a bank's name were included in the same sentence. Now you can't even keep up with all the banks and all the financial institutions who are doing projects actively uh, and increasingly are moving to production for some of these systems. So I guess, you know, what, what should we be able to expect? Like what are the kind of near-term benefits coming out of DevCon that you think, uh, you know, we should be looking at? I think, I mean, there were um, a lot of applications that uh, presented themselves probably both on the last day of DEF CON and also like especially on the demo day after. Um, and there Any are in particular some, that you, you thought were interesting? I mean, there are some that are actually quite close to sort of the horizon. So look, one area that seems to be moving forward very quickly is actually AI, like identity verification. So one of them is if you look at things like Uport, and that's one example. There was also that uh, application out of Enuma that was like, basically also doing like uh, putting a blockchain stamp or like an, an account and saying the, like that account is associated with some KYC verified identity. And um, there's a few, and there is a few other ones. Like there's uh, also that integration that like Oracleize did with the yeah, Estonian e-residency certificates. Can, can you say a little bit about this? Cause I, we're, we're kind of buzzing over some of these identity, uh, you know, use cases and applications. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure everybody, you know, even understands what we're talking about, right. much less understands well, the, the I, kind of implication yeah, of identity I, on the blockchain. Like, what does it mean for us to have identity on the blockchain, and what is the Estonian uh, right. kind of example? So identity is a fairly broad concept. Like, the way that cryptographers define identity actually is very abstract. It basically is that if there exist two messages, then, you know, message A and message B, then identity is about showing that those two messages were, were created by a basically either the same entity or by kind of related entities that have authorized each other. So with this, like under this definition, it can actually be extremely broad because like a public key is an identity. And there actually are like people on the internet um, who are sort of, whose only, like, who's the only identity by which they're known basically is like some kind of an, like, cryptographic identity, like is just some kind of cryptographic public key that people know them by. And these people engage in like various, like, like internet commerce, they uh, sell whatever, whatever it is that they're selling. They have reputations and people trust them because they know the guy with the same public key uh, you know, did a thousand other things, and these, the other things that a person did, you know, were pretty legit, and, and uh, he uh, um, kept, uh, kept his word. So, you know, well, the, th the thousand and first time around, we could probably trust him. So, but then, that's one, one kind of identity. But then it gets more interesting when it's not just about sort of correlating two, like, cryptographic messages together. It's about correlating you know, like a public key that that signs uh, crypto, that cryptographically signed messages with facts about a per, like a person or an entity in the real world. So, like a social media account is another type of identity. Um, another type of uh, and a phone number is to some extent an identity. Um, then we also talk about you know government issued kind of identity certificates. So basically saying that, you know, this particular identity is a citizen of a particular country, has this particular name, has this particular date of birth, can drive, can't drive, um, you know, has some, um, a social security number, health insurance number, whatever. And uh, there, like, those different kinds of identity kind of have different applications attached. Like, in some cases, you, you know, people want to be fully anonymous. In some cases, people want to be sort of semi-anonymous, but you know, still have kind of have reputations, and you know, we call that pseudonymity. 
in some cases they actually want like most of like their interactions to be able to 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 be linkable to the sort of identity that they use for kind of everything else in the real world and um so but the problem is that I think like up until now, the tools for working with these kinds of identities have been like fairly limited, and cryptography really offers powerful tools for verifying identities and for kind of a linking linking behavior together, and for even for using identity as a basis of reputation. But these things are like things that have so far been fairly fragmented and like there haven't been sort of good like very integrated systems for them so I, I mean I think that makes sense the the the, um, the ability to kind of secure your one's identity and then uh, in addition the ability to kind of uh, have that identity be interoperable to interoperable between I think systems interoperability is really key like I think the can, goal can you actually talk about about that because when I try sure. to explain blockchain uh, one of the key things I go back to is either security or interoperability but interoperability is, is something which is quite unique to the blockchain space um, in terms of how it's used for information, uh, identity, et cetera. I mean, what does interoperability mean? I mean, for interoperability, just to be a bit more broad than identity for a bit, interoperability in a blockchain context basically means, you know, applications can talk to each other. And we'll give a few examples. So one of them is, so let's say there, there, is, uh, there are a bunch of companies right now that are issuing various kinds of tokens on, on Ethereum. So what, like, there's Digix, which is issuing a gold-backed token. There's about five projects on Demo Day that are doing various kinds of uh, like fiat currency-backed or fiat currency-packed tokens. There's obviously Ether. There's uh, various kinds of assets. So like, you know, in Augur, you have Reputation. In Maker, you have MKR and like various other sort of more exotic things. So that's like one category of thing. Now, then, there is a company that's building a flight insurance app. And guess what? If because of the magic of interoperability and standardization, you don't even need the flight insurance app and any of these other companies to cooperate. Like if as long as this flight insurance app is designed in a way that's sort of standards standards compliant, you should be able to basically you, you know get flight insurance that's denominated in gold, dollars, MKR, whatever you want. And uh, I mean, realistically, most people probably don't want an insurance package denominated in something as hyper volatile as MKR. But uh, <laughs> you know, if we're talking about even something more mundane, like being able to choose between you know a US dollar backed token or you know a token backed by euros or backed by you know Hong Kong dollars or backed by ether, that's I don't know something pretty reasonable. So that's one example. Another example is for a lot of applications, like they want they. You needs to have, uh, or you wants to have some kind of uh, identity to interact with. So some and some kind of identity that uh, at least like other users sort of know you by. Even if you look at even something like you know like a decentralized social network, there's three or five of those kinds of projects on Ethereum. Like you actually benefit. From, like it's really nice that you know you can you, you have a single identity and use that identity to interact with any of these projects. Like another kind, another important kind of interoperability is, you know, even like in the notion of an account, right? As like an an identity, like it's not even just about interacting with those kinds of services. Like accounts can hold digital assets. They can uh, participate in smart contracts. They can participate in decentralized social networks. They can do lots of things. And the nice thing is that if you have one account, and if you solve the account security problem once, then you can use that account to access pretty much everything. So like, this is an opportunity to get get rid of the days of you know having a Google Authenticator you know f um, verification for like three of your websites, then have like a, spe a specialized card for your bank account, and then have some other method of of authentication for for your email, then using your email as like a backup of authentication for twenty five internet forums and so forth. Like you can actually really improve the state of internet security by basically sort of splitting and ha splitting the problem in half. You have one group of people that focus on the security problem and one group of people that focus on building great apps. And if both sides can at least agree to be standards compliant, then any security solution can work with any app. I think that's, that's a really good point. And, and one of the, the really powerful things is, is how kind of blockchain brings all these very disparate 
uh, industries and technology stacks kind of all together uh, in this particular layer, which you know ideally is very secure. Um, I've kind of knocked you off track a bit, and I want to go back to some of the other kind of announcements that you had or some of the other um, large um, developments that came out of DevCon. There was one in particular that I, I was hoping you might speak to because it, it to me, represented some kind of um, shift in how we think about this, the state of blockchain uh, applications. And that was uh, BHP Billiton, the uh, resource company, their announcement that they're actually putting um, one of their systems into production. Um, and I think what it was, was it's, it's built on top of uh, Block Apps, which is a, a, an Ethereum-based solution. Uh, and they were taking their supply chain management uh, and actually tracking some of their core, uh, core samples, their drilling samples. Uh, and using the blockchain to securely follow uh, and ensure uh, the, the sample got from A to B to C to D. What does it kind of mean for a company as large as BHP uh, and these types of like very large um, blue chip industries starting to actually take blockchain seriously and, and rely on it for, uh, to deliver some of their core business? I, mean, I think it's incredibly positive. I think... Uh, you know, even one or two years ago, like there were definitely large companies that were excited about the technology. But going from excitement to usage, that's something completely different. And I uh, think that right now, like maybe one or two years ago, we were on the cusp of sort of mainstream excitement. But now we're starting to be on the cusp of mainstream usage. And that's very interesting. And I think it's... Uh, mm, interesting to see how it's happening in kind of different areas at the same time. Like we're talking about various sort of banking trials. We're talking about BHP built and you know you tracking um, like mining shipments. We're talking about like chronicled uh, tracking uh, like shoes. Um, Other oh, thing with Kanye. <laughs> apparently, I mean I don't follow celebrities much, but I do follow blockchain. So I guess Kanye convinced me to care about him slightly more. <laughs> um, Any other kind of uh, applications or or large announcements? Uh, especially in that kind of blue chip, you know, space. I mean, there was the you had the 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 Wan Xiang uh, announcement Smart as well. City, yes. Um, we let's see. What was that about exactly? I mean, basically, Wan Xiang is putting thirty million dollars into a kind of smart city, which is uh, which they're going to be kind of constructing. Fairly I think it was thirty time. billion. Yeah, uh, did I say million? Yeah. Billion. Sorry. Thirty billion. <laughs> it's slightly different. <laughs> thirty billion U.S. dollars. Correct. That's a much better city. <laughs> yes, 30 million Hong Kong would be like, what, a house here? Yeah, it's on the peak. <laughs> okay. um, so, like, it, this isn't strictly a blockchain project. Like, they're going to be introducing a lot of, like, different kinds of new technologies. It's meant to be a sort of holistic smart city, but, you know, blo some, something blockchain is definitely going to be part of the story. Are there other industries that um, you think kind of came out of DevCon or other industry announcements that came out of DevCon, or in addition, hmm. what are the industries that you know haven't really kind of shown up on the radar uh, that are that you hmm. think will soon be engaging kind of blockchain? I mean, we've seen everything in we've seen insurance, uh, obviously financial systems, um, obviously supply chain. Um, what are the other kind of sleepers out there? I think after finance, one of the next frontiers is going to be the tech companies. The tech companies aren't they already in it? Um. Well, Google, very slightly. Airbnb, like the aqua hire change tip, but meh. Twitter, no. Facebook, no. Uber, no. So, surprisingly enough, no. And in... The irony. <laughs> well, I mean, what do you think they're going to be doing with, uh, with blockchain? I mean, you know, now you have all these very... It, and actually, you know what, here's a good question. I, is, it any, is it a coincidence that most of the, the companies that are really actively engaging blockchain are slightly more physical in nature or deal with uh, kind of the movement of physical objects and so not, not as much the, the digital side? Or do you think that's just, you know, the evolution of how, how they're, they're kind of taking blockchain on? I think it, it could just be because for things outside of kind of tech proper, like honestly, the existing technology sucks more. So it's easier for something new and shiny with blockchains built in to uh, kind of move forward quickly. I think that's probably one part of it. Though another part is that like blockchains aren't just a kind of self thing for self-contained consumer apps. They really are something holistic that could be applied just about everywhere. What you know, kind of going on that on that 
on that notion then, um, if blockchains could be applied to everything and kind of could be everywhere, I mean, how about the average citizen? How, like, when, when am I, as a user, or when is my mom going to be able to kind of start to actually encounter blockchains in her day-to-day -day life? I mean, are we well, one year away, five years away, and where do you think the kind of lowest, where do you think the first kind of engagements that average consumers um, are going to see, you know, in their lives? I mean, potentially, if, if enough websites uh, start to see the advantage to integrate with it, even Uport a few months from now, like, that's something that seems, you know, like, this, the social backup feature especially, I think, is brilliant. And like that's something. And that, that's actually an interesting notion because we're starting to talk a little bit about online, offline, and communities engaging with the technology in order to kind of secure it. Usually we think that technology secures itself, but obviously that's not always the case. What is the social backup? So this was the feature that was like uh, Ruben just showed about you in Uport, where like basically if you lose your key, then you can sort of uh, this is your identity key. Yes. Then you can kind of ask you know some kind of. Uh, the majority of you know some circle of your friends to basically say you know this new key is corresponds to that identity now. I mean I think it's a it's a really brilliant mechanism like actually leveraging trust that exists like decentralized trust that exists in the real world in order to solve you know these sort of key security problems you know in a way that doesn't reintroduce centralized parties. Um, another company that I want that I that I've already consistently praised for doing something slightly similar is Autonomous in Singapore. They have this mechanism where if you lose your key, they uh, sort of mathematically split it up, and they give and they keep one copy themselves, and they give two copies to two law firms. So you need sort of two of those companies to collude in order to bring the key back together. So, you know, once again, a really interesting mechanism, I think. Any other kind of consumer-facing applications that you think uh, you know are going to be coming up in the next you know a couple of years where people will actually start to you know reap the harvest of blockchain that that's been promised for so many years? Hmm. I think, um, I mean, on the identity side, I think the case is fairly clear. On the uh, kind of blockchain payment slash finance side, I think uh, one of the challenges is basically that Ethereum has the same pro problem as Bitcoin, which is, number one, moving in and out is hard, and number two, price volatility. Like, it actually is really nice to be able to, if we could just have, like, things that act like dollars or euros or, you know, yen or yuan on the blockchain, but... Right now, instead, we have these like weird hyper-volatile crypto tokens that appear, where you know Ether apparently moved up by two percent right right between the time uh, that I was coming uh, coming into Hong Kong and this meetup. Whereas if a fiat currency moves by two percent, you have like mainstream news articles about it. So it's uh, that like having something that actually is uh, um, stable and you know where you can rel where you know if uh, um, Aaron is, is is buying a phone from me for you know. Uh, 0 .0 0.06 coins, that he can actually be sure that the coins will have the same value between the time that he sends them in and the time that, you know, once he receives the phone that I get them out. So, like, once that problem is solved, I think that's also going to push uh, sort of the, the frontiers forward a bit. And at that point, it's basically just like a matter of reducing friction, you know. Like, how can we make it sort of fairly seamless to move between, you know, things that are blockchain-based and you know, WeChat payments, PayPal, or, you know, whatever else so sort of in the, in the traditional world people want to use. Okay, I think that's one part. And then the other part is obviously security. And security, I think, includes, like, the security of these actual systems themselves. So, like, I think it would be terrible if customers start, like, really trusting, like, one particular, like, instance of dollars on the blockchain. And it turns out those dollars are backed by dollars at some shady bank account and the company disappears and its uh, founders like, go on a really expensive vacation you know, to, to Panama. So it's uh, like we want to make sure that these services are services that we can trust. And like in some cases, it might be the traditional sort of social slash reputational slash regulatory trust model. In some cases, you know, with blockchains, we're hoping to really introduce and get as much as we can out of this kind of more cryptographic, um, sort of backed by math trust model, and you know, in some cases, it's going to have to be a combination of both. Sure. Um, I have a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll actually open it up to the floor to ask their questions. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier today was this notion of kind of token economies. Uh, and again, one of the things I noticed at DevCon is that there were so many. Uh, there, I guess we've been calling them in the community ICOs, which stands for Initial Coin Offering. But there was actually a really great uh, talk. Uh, by a gentleman from Coin Center, uh, a lobbying slash policy think tank in Washington, D.C., that we should no longer call them ICOs because that's tripping up with the regulators too much. We should call them token launches. So 
uh, it seems like there are more token launches going on, and these token launches are raising more and more money. Um, I think we all saw with you know this Dow raise, which was 150 million U.S. dollars, which is really unprecedented. Um, that the the kind of bar for what's possible to crowdfund in the crypto world is quite high, and I think uh, just earlier this week we saw even a much smaller one um, called First Blood, which had raised about five and a half million U.S. dollars for their effort in three and a half minutes, which is really, once again, really unprecedented in what's possible. I think we're going to be seeing more of these. What do you think of, uh, you know, these notions of token economies? Where do you think um, the, the kind of mechanisms are going? And, and again, like, how should the public, uh, both, you know, individual citizens as well as uh, kind of companies start to think about uh, these mechanisms and these tokens, how they'll be used, how they'll be, you know, kind of, how we'll be interacting with them. Is it just about raising money or are there other types of uses for them? Yeah, so, I mean, it's clear that there are a lot of projects that are trying to use uh, various kinds of uh, tokens and, and, and sales in order to fund themselves. So, I, but, um, and, you know, to some degree, this makes sense because uh, there were a number of sales that were very, very successful. So, you know, Ethereum itself um, got about $18 million of Bitcoin. Then if you look at, you know, the Digix DAO got about $5 million. Then First Blood got about five, another, like, $5.5 million. So there are a lot of projects that are, like, that are seeing, you know, this is, look, you know, you can get, you can get money very uh, seemingly quite easily this way, and they're looking at it as a model. Um, but, um, and I personally like really strongly believe that both crowd sales and token and sort of token incentivization in general is like really fundamentally some, a, a good thing. And it would be a, a terrible tragedy if we were to sort of try to like move away from that model entirely. And the reason why I say that is that historically speaking, like base level protocols have always been a fairly underfunded public good. So if you look at... Okay, what would be an example of that? I mean, well, I'll, give, I'll give a very specific example. So in 2014, there was a major security bug. That was, this was called Heartbleed that you know, affected like, a really large number of websites. And uh, what, what ended up happening was that there was a bug in the uh, OpenSSL library. So this was like a really low-level library that it, a lot of projects ended up using. And one of the things that was discovered in the aftermath was that even though there were billion dollar corporations that were relying on this library, like the amount of funding that was going into actual ongoing development was like somewhere in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So basically, you know, there were like everyone dependent on it, but no single person felt that like that in they were like that there would be much of a much of a difference between they themselves contributing and they them, and them themselves not contributing. And so nobody paid money and so the thing just like ended up being like totally underfunded given its level of importance. So what we see though is that in crypto for like with these kinds of token sales for the first time we're seeing that flipped on its head. We're actually seeing low level protocols themselves being the direct object of monetization and of a sort of highly structured and incentivized approach to development. And that's something real that's really powerful. And now this isn't going to solve every public goods issue. You know, you're not going to be able to crowdfund the solution to world hunger in Africa. Why but not? It can't. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe you could actually. <laughs> you get the coin. <laughs> Who knows? All right. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. No, go, okay. Not in the next five years. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we can like we can solve this one piece of this one very real problem that's affecting the software industry. And but you know there are challenges. So like one problem is that there are already sort of various like in, various sort of incentive flaws where it's very easy to use this kind of approach to get a lot of money in the short term, but then you don't really have much incentive to use the money to actually to, uh, push the project forward. Um, another kind of problem is just generally in, in assessing quality, and this is a problem where honestly like all of the mechanisms that that, that society currently has at the at its, uh, at its hands, it's pretty bad at them because like individuals you know, often have a hard time figuring out you know, whether or not a particular project is good quality or bad quality. We, like, we can try you know, reaching out to the SEC for help, but honestly, like, this is about like, the, like, the kind of expertise that you need here is, about, is cryptographic expertise, not expertise in, fill, in filling out bureaucratic and tax forms. So it's, uh, you know, we can try and look at uh, like, even like 
various kinds of sort of social and community verification, but then you really need to make sure that, uh, you know, like th those kinds of things are often subject to manipulation. Like, you know, the fact is that yes, you can pay $2,000 for people to write very good comments about you on inter internet forums. So, and you know, there's even like an industry of people doing that on Bitcoin talk. So trying to figure out like a way of sort of sorting the good from the bad, that's another challenge. So, I mean, the third challenge is also like exactly like what mechanism actually gets used in um, figuring out uh, a, actually doing the crowd sale, like what's the economic model? And there's a few different dimensions to this. So one dimension is how do you sell it? You know, what's the price? What's the duration? What are the conditions? Like, is there a cap? What are the conditions? There are good ways of doing it and there are bad ways of doing it. So like one thing that's been popular recently is this approach of like setting a very low cap and trying to like hit the cap, get people to rush in and, and hit the cap very quickly. Problem is that very often what this ends up leading to is like only one or 200 people participate and then like everyone else who didn't get in in time feels that the whole thing was like unfair and uh, there are a few people that were able to get an advantage. So there are other approaches, but some other approaches, like they, uh, tr they end up getting like too much, uh, too much interest coming in very early and then, you know, the to not enough interest coming in later. So there are, like, that's something that I think you can't really figure out now. We just have to like, try lots of different approaches incrementally, see what works and what doesn't. Another important dimension of the economic model is what does a token do? Like a lot of people do have this sort of idea that, oh, you know, you can create a token and you, if you like somehow sort of wriggle the token into the DAP in some way, then it's going to have a value. But in reality, it's not, that's not enough. Like if, uh, the thing is, that, you know, like one question I think you have to ask is, if you are making a DAP and your DAP has some token that you're crowd selling, would this DAP work, does the, having a separate token actually help the DAP? Would the DAP not be replaceable by a DAP that does exactly the same thing, but instead of that token, it just uses Ether? A lot of the time, the answer is yes. And for those cases, you don't want to crowd, you don't really need the token, you should just use Ether. And in some cases, the answer is no, and a token actually does make sense. So one specific example where I think a token does make sense is something like Augur. Where, you know, Augur is a prediction market where people can kind of bet on events. But at the same time, for people, if you want to be able to bet on events, you need to have some mechanism for later on kind of determining what, if, what actually took place. You know, did Donald Trump win the election or did Hillary Clinton win the election? Or did everyone suddenly decide to, like, um, I don't know, write in... Um, Vote for Gary Johnson. Yeah, or I was about, I was about to, to, to come up with the name of some, uh, the name of some shady Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin person off, uh, somewhere in Florida, but uh, I couldn't come up with a name in time. Um, so, uh, the, um, well, you need some way of like deter sort of putting into the blockchain whether or not the events took place. So the approach that Augur has is basically there's this token that's called rep, and rep holders basically vote on whether on what happened. And the approach is interesting because um, like there's this mechanism that says that if you d if you agree with the majority, then you get rewarded, but if you disagree with the majority, then you get penalized. And so the sort of economic pr principle here is that if, you know, you were to, uh, like, if you think that everyone else is honest, then you also have the incentive to be honest yourself because you want to agree with the majority. And so it's a sort of so nice self-enforcing equilibrium, which is sort of game theoretically very cool. But the thing is, like, this kind of thing would not work very well with Ether because if you used Ether, then, well, if there was, you know, 10,000 Ether voting, then some someone you know, some very evil person would come in with 20,000 Ether and just like outvote everyone else. So it would, it's just, it would, like it would just be too easy to just sort of break into the system and, keep, and, and wreck it. Whereas with Rep, because you have an independent token, you can do things like, for an attacker to do that, first of all, they'd have to like buy up half the Rep in existence, which would itself like push the price way up. Second of all, like basically what would happen is that after the, there would be a vote, and okay, the person who bought, who bought up all the Rep would, would win the vote. But at the same time, everyone who kind of lo who lost that particular vote, because like they were actually betting on the voting on the right answer, they would be the, Augur has this mechanism where they can kind of split off from Augur and they can kind of basically sort of create a new Augur that just has them being the rep holders. And the market would very clearly see, okay, guys, this was an attack. 
And so this this particular like version of Augur where the attacker has 80% of the rep is worthless. And the, the price of that drops to zero and there's this new sort of splinter rep that has the honest people in it. And so everyone's gonna trust that instead. So the point here is that you have this really cool game theoretic mechanism that can give sort of right answers for these, for you know, questions about the real world, at least hopefully, but it relies on an independent token in order to work. So I think we'll, I guess you're, what you're saying is we'll see a lot more of these tokens which, which kind yeah, of like perform and is, function in different ways to exactly. create liquidity in, in the system ways, in a way. For, like they, they're gonna have different roles, but I think the point is that you need your token to actually have value. Oh. And I even also say one more thing, which is that sometimes the thing that you're crowd selling might not even need to be a token. So one example is, Let's suppose he wants to build a domain name system on Ethereum. Instead of crowd selling a token, you might want to just directly crowd sell, let's say, the one letter domain names. Like if you're crowd selling, you know, like .eth, that, or, be, or being able to like make .eth domains inside of Mist, now like people might be willing to pay a lot of money to be able to have, you know, x.eth or 2.eth. There's a crowd selling opportunity. Another example, let's say you have a decentralized social network. Well, why not crowd sell a future advertising space? And, you know, so there are lots of opportunities like that that might be underexplored as well. Okay. I think that's uh, kind of all the time we have for now. Of course, uh, Vitalik will be here for a little bit. Um, I just want to say thank you for, once again, taking time to um, kind of share all of your thoughts and, and takeaways from DevCon. Um, so thank you. Uh, and I just want to hand over to Simon. Well, only, only just to say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much on behalf of KPMG for coming this evening. It would be remiss of us to not also thank Jihan for kindly arranging this evening on behalf of the Ethereum Meetup uh, community. So, Jihan, thank you very much to you as well. I was, um, I was just reflecting with Vitalik a little bit earlier on the June session we had, which I think was entitled um, The Road Ahead. And to... Um, to Vitalik's credit and foresight, his opening comments reflected on the fact that the road ahead could well be a bumpy one. And for those who know their dates and were here last time, three days later, uh, the Dow hack came and went. Um, tonight's discussion has been a little bit more reflective on the past in terms of the uh, DevCon 2 conference in Shanghai. So I'm really hoping that in three days' time, we're not going to have a similar experience to the last one. Um, but Vitalik, thank you very much again. Fantastic and very interesting as always to um, spend some time with you. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy the refreshments. <laughs>